Milken Institute is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank helping people to build meaningful lives. Its Asia Summit flagship event brings together top policymakers, executives, and investors from around the world to collaborate. Now, the 2020 Asia Summit is a content partner for our global channel, bringing you valuable content like this throughout the event. We now go into three back-to-back -back Milken Institute sessions, looking to how recent events have affected the policies and actions of both private and government sectors in the U.S. Now, you may need to refresh your screen if you're finding that there's a bit of a lag between some of the conversations and the audio that you're getting. The following sessions will allow us to glean insights from the U.S. Department of Commerce, the Council on Foreign Relations, and Foreign Relations Committee, including a session on inclusion and innovation, a conversation with Jelena McWilliams. They will also feature policymakers from India's Ministry of Finance, together with private company leaders from Godrej Industries and Salesforce India. Let's begin the first discussion. Hello, and welcome to a conversation with Yelena McWilliams, Chairman of the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. My name is Mike Pivovar, and I'm the Executive Director of the Milken Institute Center for Financial Markets, and I'll be serving as the moderator. I'm so pleased to be with Chairman McWilliams today. I first met her when I had the honor of working with her during our time together on the U.S. Senate Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs, working for Senators Richard Shelby and Mike Crapo. She rose to become chief counsel of the committee. Chairman McWilliams has had a distinguished career in banking law and regulation that also includes experience at a large regional U.S. bank, the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, and a leading law firm. She was sworn in as the 21st chairman of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, or FDIC, on June 5th, 2018. In that role, she is responsible for maintaining stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. Among other things, she oversees the insuring of bank deposits and the examination and supervision of financial institutions for safety, soundness, and consumer protection. She speaks often about the importance of fostering technology and encouraging innovation in the banking system. And that will be the focus of today's conversation. Chairman McWilliams, thank you for taking the time to be with us here today and to share your thoughts and insights. Let me start with a broad question. How is innovation and technology transforming banking? Thank you, Mike, and it's a pleasure to see you again, albeit on the screen, and I miss our days of working together on the Senate Banking Committee, where I had to remind you, you're not a lawyer and stop doing red lines, you're an economist. Dia, um, uh, thank you for having me uh, on, on this important subject. Um, technology today, frankly, is the, I believe, a great equalizer. Not only is it an enabler in the society for, um, for a number of services and channels and distribution channels uh, that, that before were not available to banks, and their customers, but it's also a great equalizer, equalizer in the sense that, you know, we talk about equality in the United States and, and the world in general, and we talk about making uh, financial services accessible to everybody. And I believe that technology is going to bring us there uh, with its innovation and kind of a, the, the cutting edge of, of what, uh, what we can consider uh, for a financial product and how do we offer it to consumers. So from my perspective as a bank regulator, it's, impor it's important that we embrace technology and allow our banks to embrace technology so they can retain the competitive edge and reach more customers and frankly uh, aid in, in, the, uh, in, in diminishing the, the gap between the, the haves and have nots in the, in the United States. Yeah, can you give us some um, some specific examples? I know you've spoken about there's you know some broad categories of exactly how um, it, it is accomplishing what you're talking about. Can, can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. So one of the biggest things in the United States that you can do to create wealth as an ordinary citizen uh, is to own a house. And so to qualify for a house for a mortgage, uh, not many people have enough to, to buy the, the house outright in cash in the United States. So you're required generally to put about 20% down, in some cases less than 20% if you have the private mortgage insurance. But in the traditional underwriting criteria to qualify for the purchase of that house have been very strict. And now we have alternative data entering 
using the, the underwriting formulas that previously wasn't available. And I think your audience will probably, um, um, I think in the United States, we call it alternative data. They may call it something else uh, throughout the world, but it's basically consumer's use of, of cell phone uh, and the payment on the cell phone bills, the utility bills, you know, do you pay your water, sewage, garbage, uh, and uh, electricity. And then analyzing that type of data to understand how consumers uh, um, pay their bills. And even though that's not a traditional credit product, which they are paying for on a monthly basis, analyzing their payment pattern and including that in the formula for underwriting principles uh, at banks and technology companies and the fintechs, frankly, to understand, can we give this consumer credit? And this, this thinking about alternative data has actually rev revolutionized availability of credit in the United States. And until recently, it was only done by fintechs and, and you know, the technology companies that are in the financial services space, but um, uh, that has ended up, this advantaging bank customers who couldn't use the same data set to obtain a mortgage uh, within the banking sector. So we have over the past year, um, you know, this is just one example, but we have, um, I would say, revol revolutionized the way we allow banks to look at alternative data by basically greenlighting the ability of banks to look at non-traditional underwriting metrics and non-traditional non credit metrics in order to allow customers to qualify for credit. And this has allowed customers that are in the lower bracket of the credit scoring to uh, be able to qualify for credit and, and prosper uh, in the United States. Yeah, so let me let me follow up on that, right? So you've, you've talked passionately about um, the necessity of creating a financial system of inclusion and belonging so that everyone has uh, equality of opportunity to achieve the American dream. Um, this mission is, it's not just theoretical or, or academic to you, it's, it's very personal. Please, please tell us about your story. It is very personal. And so I came uh, to the United States. I, I immigrated to the United States from the former Yugoslavia in 1991 with $500 in my pocket. And uh, my parents were left behind. Uh, my parents actually had to borrow the $500 and the, the cost of the airline ticket to send me to the United States. And, and I insisted on coming here because I believe this was the land of opportunity. And so when you're in the United States by yourself at the age of 18 with no parental support, no economic uh, means, uh, no job, no assets, no credit history, it's really impossible to qualify for credit. At the same time, you don't have access to cash because you just you, you have the $500. And so in the beginning, when I first came here, I knew I should put my money in a bank and I opened up a checking account. And then I realized everybody was using credit cards, which the notion of credit, I think, frankly, differs in different societies. Uh, and I know my father grew up uh, and, and also instructed me I should never have anything, purchase anything on credit. I shouldn't have debt, right? And then I come to the United States and I realize that uh, A, it's a consumer culture, and B, um, if I don't have access to cash and I don't have access to credit, I really don't have ability to survive in the United States. So I applied for a credit card. I couldn't get an unsecured credit card. I had to send in $300 of my $500 to get a secured credit card and explain to my father back in Yugoslavia that uh, this made sense. I'm going to send my money to the bank. The bank is going to hold my money. I'm going to borrow against my money that now the bank holds and I'm going to pay bank interest on it. And if you really think about it, that entire concept did not make sense to somebody who's not used to, to the notion of consumer credit and bank credit. Nonetheless, after 12 months of on-time payments, I was able to get my deposit back. I was given a um, regular unsecured credit card and that has led to my building the credit score in the United States that then allowed me to purchase a car and finance it, purchase a you know, house and finance it, get student loans, put myself to law school. And in the end, I, I joke that, you know, but for that initial secured credit card, who knows if I would have become the FDIC chairman. And, and it's only a, a little, you know, I, I use that as a, as a joke, but there's part truth in that because you can't really do much in, in this society without ability to have funding. And, you know, Galbraith, the economist, the great economist, wrote about uh, that either you have cash or you have credit. And if you can manage that credit responsibly, frankly, uh, you, can, you can avail yourself of, the yourself of the benefits that the society has to offer. And over the longer term, you can prosper economically and ensure that the future generations can prosper by you building equity, by you being able to purchase a house and then giving that house to your to your um, um, to your children, et cetera. So it's it's a way of building um, access to financial services uh, in the United States that I have a very keen interest in because of my personal story, but also because I think that we need to democratize finance in a way that's responsible and that enables people in the long term 
to use credit and understand how to use credit and become informed consumers so that they have the ability to avail themselves of, of better economic life than their predecessors. Wow, so you've taken that $500 and you've parlayed that into really achieving the American dream. Um, and now you're committed to using your position as you've just talked about to, to help as many people achieve the same, right? So um, in addition to you know lowering the cost of credit and um, bringing more people um, into the financial system that were not traditionally there before, how else can financial innovation and, and technology help in this regard? So I think that a couple of couple of angles here are one is removing barriers for financial institutions to do what in the past they couldn't do. And this is really where when we talk about innovation and technology, we need to understand why we have all of the so-called fintechs entering the, this space instead of the traditional banks. If you look at banks, they've been on the kind of a cutting edge of innovation since the Medici brothers created the double ledger system. Uh, and, and, you know, then we had the ATMs and we have the credit cards, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And all all of those products were generally invented by banks. And then we come to the, you know, the 2000s, technology has improved, the ability of technology companies to ascertain a lot of things, to analyze data, um, understand consumers' ability to repay, as we talked about, about alternative data, came into place. And that was not possible to develop inside the banking sector because frankly, we have imposed such a regulatory framework on our banks in the United States in particular, that innovation is not um, at the top, at the forefront of, of their um, agenda. Most often they are concerned what the regulators are going to say about innovation and then being on the cutting edge of technology and offering these products and services to their customers. And so we have seen over the last 20 years, most of that innovation taking place outside of the banks. So I like to say that we have regulated the banks so much that we have um, reduced risk inside the banking sector, but we did not reduce risk inside of the financial sector because that risk has left the banks and is now being done by non-banks who are in the financial services area. And so the idea here behind innovation is to bring that innovation to banks because banks have the platforms, they have the distribution channels, and they have, frankly, the customer base to uh, be able to avail themselves of, of this new technology and, you know, using it for good, using it, frankly, to expand economic inclusion in the United States. And one of the best products for economic inclusion in the United States, I think, is the small dollar offering. And, and Mike, you're an economist. Yeah, I know you follow the Federal Reserve. There, there were numerous reports coming of the, uh, from the Federal Reserve over the years uh, that say that 40, uh, that about 60% of the population in the United States does not have $400 to spend in an emergency. They would have to borrow that money or put it on the credit card if they, if they can't borrow it from a friend or, or a family member. So when you think about it, such a large population in the United States doesn't have basic $400 if their car breaks down uh, or if their, if their paycheck is late for some reason, it makes you think about what product do they need to sustain themselves from, you know, the first of the month until the last of the month. And small dollar offering is, is I think, a perfect example of what we've done um, by issuing guidance, getting the regulatory agencies at the United States, in the United States at the same table and basically saying, let's encourage banks to offer small dollar offerings to their customers, because that's a way, frankly, to bring a new customer into the fold and also to, un to ensure that, um, that you know, somewhat selfishly from the bank regulatory perspective, we can regulate for consumer protection, but at the same time, expand the network of people who are banked versus people who are unbanked and have to use alternative products like uh, pawn shops and, and payday lending channels for $400. Yeah, in the in the United States, we have thousands of small community banks, right? So when people think of banking in the United States, we think of the big mega banks. But we, you know, you you, you have thousands of small smaller community banks uh, that that you oversee, and uh, we at the Milken Institute have done some research into the particular role that some of these banks, uh, minority deposit institutions, community development financing institutions, play in this. Um, but these small banks face unique challenges on the path to innovation. Um, what are you doing at the, SC, at the FDIC to, to help these, these particularly small banks? So it really, when, when um, people think about the regulatory framework and the banking system in the United States, there are two things that, that most people outside of the United States uh, find difficult to, to, uh, to grasp and understand why, but it's kind of a morphed over time with, with the evolution of the United States as a country. So we have fragmented regulatory framework, you know, where we have the state banks and national banks, and they're supervised by numerous agencies, including at the state level. 
Uh, and then we also have the, the community banks versus regional banks versus very large banks uh, that, that fall into the systemically important category. And when we talk about the number of banks in the United States, you're right. We have over 5,100 banks um, right now in the United States, and that's from a, from a high of about 30,000. Um, and only about, I would say, 30 to 40 are over $50 billion in size. So when we look at the banking sector here, most of the banks, the vast majority, are very small banks. You know, some of them are in the billions, but most of them are in the hundreds of millions and a number of them are actually below $500 million in the asset size. So when we talk about these institutions, they're frankly in rural America quite often. They are, you know, supporting the farming community in Kansas or the, um, you know, the, the oil and gas community in Texas. And so when we think about helping these institutions, you know, we have to look at the regulatory burden that we have imposed over the years on these institutions that are not that large, but are regulated because of all of the events of the 2008 financial crisis as if they were much larger. So we have approached this from a couple of perspectives. One is to reduce some of that regulatory burden while still maintaining safety and soundness and consumer protection on those banks. And the other one is to reach out to, as you mentioned, minority depository institutions and community development financial institutions that support communities, uh, low and moderate income communities um, that are generally uh, communities of color to see how can we be helpful to them. And we don't regulate CDFIs uh, uh, at the FDIC, but we do regulate the so-called MDIs, minority depository institutions. And so what we have done, we have done a number of things that frankly have been um, about thinking outside of the box, how we can help these institutions, including organizing uh, speed dating events uh, where we put larger banks and MDIs in the same room to see if there's an opportunity for partnerships and capital infusion. We have done um, a number of things where we now allow the MDIs to come in about two weeks early for, to bid on failing MDIs. You know, we have this process in the United States where the FDIC, we resolve banks. That's one of our mandates when they're failing. And we now allow minority depository institutions a, a heads up, a, you know, two week period to allow them to do due diligence and prepare an offer on a failing MDI so that, they, that these banks can uh, stay in their communities uh, with the minority uh, de uh, depository institution character. Uh, we have also now created uh, an MDI fund, um, a mission-driven fund, we call it mission-driven fund, to basically um, solicit um, and, and um, enable non-banks to invest in this fund than, than community banks that are minor, minority depository institutions and CDFIs would be able to come in and pitch, uh, you know, I call it the, the FDIC shark tank, uh, to pitch for the, for the capital that would then be invested in the MDI to ensure that these communities can continue to receive funding through these institutions, which quite often lack capital and struggle to retain uh, and attain large deposits to, to the financial institution. So we have done a number of things. You can find more about this on our website, but it's, uh, it frankly has been one of my priorities as a chairman, as I try to attract uh, more funding into the uh, low and moderate income communities in the United States. Yeah, and your website is fdic.gov, correct? Yeah. Gov. Okay, great. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, you've said, quote, data is the new capital. The question for industry is how to best utilize data and technology to meet consumer demands. The question for regulators is how to allow industry to, to do so while maintaining safety, soundness, and consumer protection. FDI tech will bridge that gap, unquote. So tell us about this FDI tech initiative. Sure. So, you know, it seems to be like the topic du jour for, for regulatory agencies to create offices of innovation. And what we wanted to do at the FDIC, not just create an office of innovation so that we have an office of innovation, but we wanted to do something pragmatic with it and realizing how much data there is um, out there. And uh, the, the fact that banks of the future are going to look more and more like technology companies. And I think at some point we're going to come um, uh, to, to see that there is very little different between, difference between a technology company and a bank because they're basically driven by the same platforms and, and the same uh, framework. We decided to see how can we utilize data for good at the FDIC. And so through this Office of Innovation that we call FDI Tech, we have done a couple of things that uh, frankly um, are, I believe, at the forefront of the regulatory achievement, at least in the United States. And one of the things that we have done is try to figure out if we can eliminate our quarterly data uh, uh, call reports that we collect from the banks. 
So every quarter, large banks in the United States submit about 24, 2,500 data fields to the FDIC and smaller banks submit about 1,200 data fields, which allow us to take a look at a cross section of different categories and portfolios and to ascertain the, um, the health of the financial uh, sector in the United States, the banks in particular. And we're trying to see if there's a way to maybe collect that data on a more timely basis than wait to the end of the quarter and then have that data available. So it's about there's always going to be a lag under the current system of at least 40 to, in some cases, even 60 days uh, from when the data is submitted until we, did, we can actually appropriately analyze data. So using technology to figure out if we can come to uh, more of a um, real-time data production that would allow us to spot financial uh, issues in the financial industry and then be able to address those on a timely basis. The other thing we have done is uh, we have engaged um, in rapid prototyping with technology companies to figure out if we can have a standard setting body that would allow technology companies and fintechs that are looking to uh, team up with banks to go through certification process and examination by the FDIC um, and then uh, be able to team up with the banks uh, by presenting this good housekeeping seal of approval and then being able to cut down the burden of doing due diligence and onboarding for tech companies that are looking to have a symbiotic partnership with a bank. Wow, quite a, quite a number of exciting uh, initiatives. And again, if, you, if, if people want to learn more, FDIC.gov. Um, with that, Chairman McWilliams, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us here today. And thank you for your many years of public service, especially in your current role in maintaining stability and, and public confidence in the U.S. financial system. I hope you and your family have a happy and healthy holiday season. Goodbye. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you for what you're doing on the issue of technology and inclusion.